Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, staying for the, the music panel. We have, a, we have a great panel here today that uh, I put together kind of representing the different kind of the, the different pieces of, the, of today's music industry. And I'll introduce them to you now. Bill Campbell, to my immediate right, is uh, the SVP of digital business uh, uh, in the Global Digital Business Group at Universal Music, which is the biggest record company uh, in the world today. He was, prior to that, he was, held various roles at Sony Music, beginning in 1998 as manager of business affairs and uh, uh, growing, rising to SVP of business development for US digital business. He also started in the mailroom. He just told me earlier, he started in the mailroom at SBK Records back in the day, kind of the uh, same, same place that, not the same company, but the same starting point as, as David Geffen and EMI Music Publishing. So that's Bill Campbell. Um, on the far end is Mike Dornberg, who's the CEO of Rever Reverb Nation. And the Reverb Nation is the leading online marketing platform that serves more than two and a half million artists, managers, uh, record labels, and venues. Mike has been a successful entrepreneur uh, and in, in both marketing and management of technology and internet businesses based down in the Research Triangle of North Carolina. His past ventures include SmartPath, a marketing software company that was successfully acquired by DoubleClick in 2004, um, and the Marathon Group, an internet services organization acquired by Marant uh, PLC. Um, to his left is Eric LeCamp, who's director of, uh, I'm sorry, Brian president. Brian, Brian LeCamp. What did I say? Eric, sorry. Oh, geez, I got you guys cross-fertilized cross there. Brian LeCamp. <laughs> And I know all these guys for a long time. Um, Brian, Brian is the president of digital for Clear Channel Media and Entertainment. He oversees the company's digital strategy, which includes iHeartRadio, as well as the infrastructure, tools, and social media integration for its local stations, branded internet properties. Prior to the, his current role at Clear Channel, Brian was EVP of digital media at Premier Radio Networks. And in 2007, Brian co-founded Flux, am I pronouncing Flux. that? Flux. Uh, maybe there's an extra E on there that shouldn't have been. Digital media startup focused on online music. He also has served as SVP of digital policy at Sony Pictures Entertainment and was pra the practice director for media and entertainment at Viant Inc., where he led the MovieLink initiative, Hollywood's first digital distribution platform for feature films. And last but not least, Eric Garland, who is the founder of uh, big data startup Big Champagne, co-founder of Live Nation Labs, and GM of LiveNation.com. Eric has been, uh, uh, or I should say, Big Champagne was described by Wired Magazine as the Nielsen ratings of online music. It was the first company to try to measure uh, online music uh, trading and peer-to-peer -peer trading and, and use of music over the internet. Fast Company named Big Champagne to their 2011 list of world's most innovative companies. He's been profiled in, uh, in 2010 in Forbes in the 40 under 40 issue, but I don't think he's under 40 anymore. Just uh, uh, His work <laughs> was included in Chris Anderson's well-known and best-selling book, The Long Tail. Um, and he also advises a wide variety of young companies and nonprofits. So that's our esteemed group today. Um, and before we start, I'll just give a quick uh, kind of two-minute overview of where the music industry is, and then I'll let the guys tell you about th what they're doing and, and how they see the, the continued disruption of, of the music business, because the recorded music industry was the first media business to be disrupted, to be consumed by the digital revolution. Um, and it's helped to drive, I think you could say it's helped to drive more broadband connections and device sales than revenue for the, uh, the content owners over the last decade. But that seems to be changing. And just the other day, the IFPI uh, announced that global music sales rose for the first time since 1999, albeit a, a very small amount, 
Um, it's the first time it has not declined. And uh, while the worldwide revenue is $16.5 billion, which is a, a far cry from what it was, which was more like 38, um, nevertheless, we, we seem to have hit, hit bottom and we're, we're moving back up as finally digital sales and other sources of revenue um, are enough to offset the continuing decline of, of the CD and, and packaged goods. More promising for the industry are, are the advent and the increasing use of subscription music services and online radio. And we're going to get into all of that now. I'm going to actually uh, start with, with Bill Campbell from Universal, who's responsible for licensing most, uh, if not all, of these types of service, and, and ask him, how are these models progressing? What seems to be on the, uh, on the uptake? And um, also, if in the course of maybe prior to answering that, if you could talk a little bit about your organization and uh, where where the global digital business group fits inside of the the universal corporate? Sure. So yes, yeah, so my my uh, group is the global digital business group, and we are the responsible party for all the licensing uh, opportunities for the full catalog of music, video, mobile personalization products, and new business models that um, that the music industry, uh, specifically UMG, is is focused on. Um, we. Uh, support all the label groups and we have over 35 now we just acquired EMI so we have a few more um, and so we also support all the local operating companies uh, throughout the world in all of their business uh, initiatives that relate to digital so it's a it's a comprehensive group that uh, is made up of digital business development business and legal affairs new technology uh, finance etc as well as global account management um, so we're responsible for opening up effectively digital distribution channels throughout the world um, so, yeah, you're right, Dick. I mean, our, our industry has been halved by a variety of different things, and I would say that um, the music industry, more than any other entity, was the first entity to be um, disrupted by the Internet, for better or for worse, and it seems like it might be for better uh, at this point. But, you know, c shifting a, from a business model where you create a, uh, a music product in whatever configuration that might be, an album, a c CD, a, an 8-track uh, cassette tape, um, to a, a model where um, the album has been um, disassembled uh, from an Apple digital download standpoint and it's been disassembled even further to an individual stream. So we have, I think, turned the corner. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, we, this year uh, we were up by a very small percentage, but I'd like to think that that was because of the hundreds of different digital partners that we've been able to put in place over the last five years. Uh, when I started in digital back in 2001, um, I was in the traditional business and legal affairs side of things and uh, saw an opportunity to get involved in digital and just volunteered and raised my hand and thought this was an interesting uh, place to go. Um, we were a rounding error. I mean, in terms of digital revenue, <laughs> we, we, uh, no one wanted to pay any attention to us. Um, and uh, we were kind of scoffed and sort of put into a different building and, uh, you know, <laughs> we barely got heat and water. Um, right. But, you know, now we represent 50% of the overall revenue for the company. So um, that's a tr tremendous change over the last five years. Yeah, the, the, I actually was going to mention that, and I'm glad you reminded me that in the U.S., uh, we are at really at the 50% tipping point for digital versus uh, analog, for whatever term you want to call it. In the world, it, worldwide, it's more like 35%, but here it's about 50. Right. And, and I think you mentioned to me when we were talking earlier that digital was up year over year 9%. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, digital represented a good chunk of our overall revenue this year, and we, we hope that it continues in that trend. Um, but, you know, we can't slow down. Really, right now, it's about how do we accelerate that growth? How do we continue the momentum, uh, you know, as people, less and less people buy physical CDs um, and as more and more people go to um, streaming services, how do we monetize those? We're working closely with digital radio partners, with subscription-based partners, with digital download partners. So in a lot of ways, we've been on the forefront, and we've been on the, the in the trenches fighting the good fight, um, trying to create these new business models, and some of them have worked and some of them haven't, but um, we're, always, we're always innovating. 
uh, one more for you as a follow-up. The, the, the concept of subscription music, which some of you, how many, how many in this room actually even know what subscription music is or, or use Spotify or Rhapsody or anything? That's a pretty good number. That's great. More hands just went up. That made me What's feel that? a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, we, there, is a, there is a fairly significant growth factor there, but still as an overall, as an overall market, it's very, very tiny. Um, and the industry seems to be grappling with pricing and how to present the content in a way that makes it compelling. And I think you'll see some, some uh, improvements in that in the, in, over the next few years. Um, um, I'm going go to uh, I'm gonna go to Mike Dornberg next, who um, runs Reverb Nation, which is, is the leading um, direct-to-fan and marketing platform for uh, independent artists, and not just independent artists, but uh, I guess you could call it the... Um, uh, yeah, the long, the, the long tail. And, and uh, he's, got, he's had an unbelievable experience and built a, a, a very large company based on, on the, what the young artists or independent artists needs in the way of marketing tools and distribution tools to, to go into the market without a big record company like Bill's, or maybe just to su supplement the effort that the, the that uh, if they are signed to a record company. Um, t tell us, uh, Mike, about um, what has this done for the artists? Uh, has it actually, does it actually drive more revenue or is it more of a branding exercise? And, and how has it improved the experience for, for consumers or has it? Um. I have two kids, 19-year-old and 15-year-old, and I pretty much learn everything I need to from my kids. And when I was growing up, I probably, so I'm, I'll be 49 next week, and uh, I remember when pretty much every major album came out, and I was cool if I could get the first, if I could be the first one to get it and bring it home and play it for all my friends. That's fundamentally changed. My kids have 5,000 songs on their iPod. Most of them they don't listen to. They spend very little time with any one of them. And what's happening is, when I think about what we do, it used to be that there was a very, very clear gate you had to go through. You had to get signed by Universal. You had to. And because so much more music is being listened to, it's harder and harder and harder to create celebrity. It's harder and harder and harder to create sustainable careers. And the artists have to demonstrate their value, I believe, at a, in a much more substantial way than they ever have before. They have to not only be good, but they have to be able to prove that they can operate in the world at a much higher level before they get signed. Because if you're a major record label, you can't afford to make the bets you used to. You need to make more of them. So I would argue that, that what we represent really isn't so much about bands making, making money. Because the truth is that there are two, there's two worlds, and they're very distinct. There's the bands that have achieved a level of success and are in harvest mode. They can command high prices for their music. They can strike deals that other people can't. And then there's everyone else. And everyone else is really trying to make their way. They're trying to rise from obscurity. And that introduces some real opportunity. What we've found is that, well, I think about music a little bit like the way I think about water, is that some people drink it, some people will buy it, but for the most part it gets used all over the place. And I think that music in many ways has, and I think this is true for this group, what music represents, I, I think the, there's certainly value in music still. There's no question. There's value in the song. But for the, what I think is happening is that music is be starting to be valued in terms of what it can do for you. What else can it sell? And I think that what we try and do is we try and take all the people that, don't, that aren't in harvest mode and trying to create ways for that music to be leveraged by others. Hopefully, by, you, by people leveraging it, it starts to get noticed. And when it starts to get noticed, they sign them. And that, so I don't really look at direct-to-fan as a way to get rich. Maybe incrementally it improves how much money you make. What I really look at it as a way, is a way that you can establish yourself, rise from obscurity, and be you know, part of the one-tenth of one percent that, that can achieve success. It's, it's clear if you watch 
television these days that uh, a lot of independent artists are getting big breaks on, with syncs on network television shows or in, in TV commercials. Uh, does Reverb Nation work to uh, get those placements? A absolutely. I mean, you know, we, um, we've had placements in lots of different places, but I, I would say that, you know, for, for a band, getting a placement is almost, it's, it's become, for, for certain genres, it's become almost critical to achieving success. I would argue that even the bigger, even, even, even major record labels, one of the very first things that they want to do is they want to get a sync and then time that, the, 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 you know, time the drop of the release with that sync. I would say for the brand, what they've begun to do is they've started to use music to differentiate themselves in more profound ways because it used to be you had to sync, you had to license a single song and then you would make that part of a television commercial. But now it's becoming central, not to every brand, because not every brand cares about music, let's be honest. I mean, some, band, some, some brands it makes more sense for than others. But for those brands where it makes sense, I think they're looking to music as ways to, to differentiate themselves. So I think there's a much closer relationship I think with a broader set of artists than there ever has been before. And you can see that in a, in a lot of the music that's been popularized over the last few years um, by brands. The competition for those slots is, is fierce. It's, it's really uh, sinks and, and uh, uh, advertising have become the new radio. Uh, yes, we're gonna, Brian's gonna speak to this as well. Sure, every artist wants their records played on the radio, but the the ones that are played on the radio are are a, a, the most commercialized pop or hip hop records. That it's it's such a small number compared to what's released. You have a better chance as an artist, and uh, especially if you're not a pop artist, to get a sync. And so the competition is extremely fierce. And if I'm I correct me if I'm wrong, because the competition is so fierce, the price has actually been driven down uh, so that it's not so much about how much the artist gets or the publishing company gets for the sync. They might only get a couple thousand dollars, but it's the, it's the positioning and the, abil the ability for a national audience to hear a song can break. I mean, and this goes all the way back to the Apple, the early iPod ads with totally unknown artists that broke Nobody, you know, had no idea who the artist was, and, and it continues, continues on. Um, let's let's actually go to, to Brian um, and uh, and talk about radio. It's it, you know one of the questions, and also if you wouldn't mind talking about your organization a little bit. Um, uh, Brian's company has very successfully created an internet-only brand, or maybe it's not internet-only, but iHeartRadio. Clear Channel, so I'll ask him to talk to that and and to the, you know, it's become so much radio is now consumed online. It is is the traditional AM FM eventually going to just go away, um, in favor of of all digital internet streaming? You know, I don't think so. I, I you know, w with radio, radio has been around for fifty plus years, and we've seen a lot of different ways that consumers connect through radio. AM, FM, uh, satellite, and now internet. And each of those has represented additional listening and, and new channels for consumers to connect with the brands that they love. What we, what we at Clear Channel do, um, you know, we started out as an inherently local company. We've been, uh, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on with iHeartRadio and some of our other, uh, some of our other work recently is pulling together a, a national strategy. We realized, you know, five years ago, if you'd asked uh, somebody at Clear Channel, picked somebody in the New York, in New York, and said, how big is, uh, how big is uh, uh, Clear Channel, they would have answered with a number that was a New York market number. Nobody really knew how big Clear Channel was. And it turns out, you know, we reach 241 million Americans a month across all of our properties, which include syndicated shows and include over 850 radio station sites. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that eclipses any other media company in the United States. What digital is for us is a new, a, a new channel for us to reach consumer, new consumers, new occasions to reach those consumers, and an, an opportunity to use technology to uh, uh, fulfill a lot of the promise around discovery and social connections that have always been inherent in radio but haven't been 
um, they haven't been that easy to make the connection. Sure, we've always had call-ins that let radio feel, uh, feel social, but now, uh, whether it's channels like Twitter and Facebook and, and others, the, the connections are deeper and, uh, and we can really uh, resonate those connections uh, and, and supersize them. Well, you also, for the first time, with iHeart, you have data as to who's listening as opposed to terrestrial, and that's got to be very valuable. It is. I mean, you know, we're, and, and it's it's great to get a deeper um, deeper understanding of our consumers. We're you know really excited about the uh, consumers have voted with their clicks and their ears for iHeart. Uh, uh, one of the one of the, the things that you know, as a product guy that I'm particularly proud of is is the volume at which and, and speed at which it's grown in, in a little over 12 months. We've we've taken it from zero to over 20 million registered users. We're now at uh, just over uh, 26 million. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that, though, is that if you compare that to uh, a lot of the, the other names that are typically, you know, you typically talk about the Instagrams, the Pinterests, the Spotify's, the, the Facebooks of the world, we got to 20 million faster than any of them mm -hmm. uh, and in a, in a really accelerated way. And what's even more interesting about that is that the substantial use case of iHeart is a live listening use case that doesn't require registration. So. Uh, what I think that's really attributable to is a, a real focus in the company on digital, the power of radio to activate um, consumers and drive awareness. Uh, we drove uh, brand awareness over 51% within, uh, within an incredibly uh, uh, rapid time frame. And of course, you know, uh, being responsible for the product, I, it's a kick-ass product. But, um, it's, it's a real focus by the company on, on digital to extend uh, what has made radio great for 50 years. Yeah, are you... Well, I'll rephrase this. You're not. It's not. It's not a question. It, it's a comment, and then uh, you could maybe comment on that. You're in competition with Pandora and and other radio services to get into the dashboard on in automobiles now. That's where. That's the. That's the next sort of playing field that you, where you're competing, not just on the on the PC or tablet, but now in in the car. How is that going? And how? What? What are? What particular? Issues are that issues are there in the automotive space that aren't in the other platforms. Sure, um, you, you, we, I get that question a lot. We, we we don't compete with Pandora in the core of our business, so it, and um, the way the music ecosystem has lived for 50 years has been uh, radio and music collection. Started out as uh, records, uh, cassettes, CDs, and you know now it's Spotify is, is your or Rhapsody is your version of a music collection. Radio for us is about the live connection. It's about a public mentality. It's about users wanting to lean into the world, connect to local information, uh, music discovery. Somebody else curates it for me. And, uh, and music collections are about a much more private. I'm curating it for myself. I'm taking responsibility. I'm, I'm in my own, my own space. Pandora is much more akin to the mentality that you have around music collections, where you're zoning into your specific uh, music that you want to listen to. And you know, we, we make that distinction. We recognize full well we have a custom radio feature just uh, that, that does what Pandora does as well. But we, we see live radio, it's very different than, than what Pandora is doing. As far as the auto is concerned, uh, definitely an important venue. We've we've been in the car for over 50 years. A car is the original mobile device, um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and you know so we have that that legacy. It's incredibly important to us. We're continuing to innovate there. Uh, just at CES, we announced a, a bunch of uh, made a bunch of announcements. Partnerships with GM and Chrysler. Uh, we announced a an application that is specific to the car a version of iHeartRadio called uh, iHeart Auto. Um, and, uh, and part of that is uh, when you're in a car, you need to take safety into account. Driver distraction is one of the things that, that you, you absolutely need to, to uh, take into consideration. And so we presented a simplified uh, version of iHeartRadio that, uh, that takes all of the great features but distills them down into a simple user interface and will continue to innovate in the car because it's an important venue for us. Great. Thank you. Eric, thanks for being patient. Um, Eric brings two perspectives that are, are unique to this panel. One is the, the, the big data perspective. His company, Big Champagne, was, was purchased by Live Nation last year. Um, and now that he's there, and I'll let him explain the different hats that he wears there and 
the different kinds of staffing uh, requirements for those different pieces of his business, but also to talk about how, how digital has impacted the live music business. What can we look forward to um, the, that will improve the, the live concert experience, whether it's the improving the experience of going to the gig or improving the experience of watching it at home? Yeah, thanks, Dick. I mean, I've been sitting here today, as, as you all have, and trying to pull uh, the, the threads out of the air, find the, find the through lines in, in all of these conversations uh, on all of these great panels and, and these keynote conversations. And I guess a, a couple of things that have resonated with me very specifically and personally. Someone, someone said earlier, someone posed the, the question, you know, do you, do you think the CDO um, will, will be a data person, or do you think the CDO will have a, a sort of data sidekick, you know, that comes along? <laughs> and, and my first thought was, yeah. oh, I sure hope, you know, I sure hope it's the sidekick, because that sidekick is going to eat the lunch of every CDO in the business. I mean, I, I just think it's an absurd notion that three or five years from now, um, you would have somebody in this role um, that, that isn't operating from a basic assumption that this is all data, and I say that with the right. with the disclosure that you know it's an occupational hazard for me. I've been building analytics businesses um, since I was an undergraduate in college. I was always an entrepreneur, and, and I was always the the only through line. If you look at everything I've ever done in my career, is that everything is data. I'm terrible at word association. You know, you say Google, YouTube, I say data. Uh, uh, <laughs> iHeartRadio, data. <laughs> Universal Music Group, data. You know, Pandora, data. Spotify. You know, all of these things um, are fundamentally going to be recognized um, as first and foremost platforms for data. And so, anyone who thinks um, that the you know that the that the analytics expertise is going to be relegated to the lackeys' cubicle, um, you, you're vulnerable. And your boss is vulnerable, and his boss is vulnerable, because those people are going to take those seats. Um, when I came into Live Nation a about one year ago, um, fortunately, you know, my boss and, and I uh, report uh, direct directly to the CEO. Michael Rapino and I had a very brief conversation where uh, we established uh, that we both believe that in the in the word association game that that Live Nation is synonymous with data, and, and specifically that a company that, uh, like Live Nation, uh, a concert promotion business, but also a, a real estate business and the parent company of Ticketmaster, has not just an opportunity, but a responsibility to be the world's best source for information about <coughs> live events, right? That's not just an opportunity. That is an absolute responsibility and obligation. And being the source doesn't mean what it has meant in the past. It doesn't mean event listings. It doesn't mean a phone book, uh, an inert uh, list of pages uh, or calendar pages, any more than, uh, than Facebook uh, or Amazon or Twitter um, is an inert list of factoids about people, right? I mean, all of this must be um, brought into the market in compelling, dynamic, and interactive ways immediately. And so what was fun and exciting for me sitting, sitting here uh, listening to all of you throughout the day um, were the moments when the conversation got, uh, got, got a little bit um, intangible or, or sort of drifted into very high-level thinking um, what I tell my team is that, you know, nights and weekends we get to be visionaries, but right now the core businesses that we're in are so badly broken from a data and analytics standpoint. And so many of us, expensive people, sit in boardrooms saying, we recognize the value of data. Our organization really recognizes the value of data. And not being able to finish that sentence that we have so much work, you know, right, right in front of us. Um, on the fundamentals, things that, that we should just really be embarrassed by um, when, it, when it comes to the state of our businesses and the intelligence that we have about our customers and the simple ability to take someone who is begging to be matched um, with interests and things and products and experiences that he or she loves and, and, and serve that person well, 
right? So, so I guess what I would say, um, my takeaway from, from the day so far, and, and now maybe I'm just, uh, I'm just offering a tidy summary of, of what I heard, um, is that we, we just have to pick up a wrench. We have to make this really simple. And, and I don't think there are room uh, yet for a lot of far-ranging philosophical arguments about who owns what and what the nature of the job is. Uh, pick up a wrench and, and start to fix the business. Can I, can I add a little something to this? Yeah. Sure. I, one of the thing, problems I have uh, sitting on this panel is we're not at a music conference. We're at the CDO, we're at the CDO Summit. And, the, and, and I think the interesting thing about the music business, having kind of come through building an internet professional services company, which is really building like really complicated websites, and then building a marketing automation solution that was really around database and segmentation, a lot of the things that went on, and then building Reverb Nation is that we've always used data. We didn't always call it digital. We didn't always call it, but we always used data. You guys have used data to figure out where you want to advertise. You figure out data to do everything. And then what happens over time, we've begun to use data in a more automated way. We began to sort of make decisions about merchandising. We began to use data. But it's always been data disconnected from the delivery of a message, from the communication with, with, with the customer. In music, we spend most of our time, a lot of us spend most of our time, figuring out how to bring data together with actionable things. We wrap our products, we wrap our services around a whole data infrastructure that allows it to operate in almost real time to make decisions, whether it be the Facebook open graph or whether it be pulling data out of our own, own information. It's, it's, it's part and parcel. Data is part and parcel to being a, digital, to, to being a, a chief digital officer. I, I heard an answer on the last question, which they asked, what is the, heart, what is the thing a digital officer needs to know? And I, asked, I told Eric, I said, I don't think, I mean, no offense to everybody there, I said, I don't think that's the right answer. I said, I think what a, a chief digital officer needs to be is they need to be a student, a student of all the little nuances, all the things that are going on, the interrelationship between things. They need to understand what's important and what's not. They need to understand how to test. They need to understand how to take what's best out of all of these different technologies and all these different companies and make it part of what their company does. So I agree with Eric. Data is so important, and, but you absolutely can't separate data from the delivery of the, of, of the, of the solution. It's two sides of the same coin. And I think that that's the way we think about it in music. I know all of us do. We think about, because in order for us to be successful, we have to employ those strategies that leverage data because, it's, because we're selling things for pennies. Pennies. If you're selling things for pennies, you better do it damn well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Eric, I want to just go back yeah. to, um, to you in regards to the progress that you envision within um, the consumer experience and how digital will improve that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, stick, I'll stick for a minute uh, to, to the scope of, of our work in, in right. Live Nation Labs. So, uh, so we have been, as an industry, uh, touching tens of millions of customers uh, who participate in live events across all categories uh, for years. And yet, you know, I, I am on mailing lists uh, for Live Nation and for Ticketmaster. Uh, not, not entirely sure how I got on those lists. Um, certainly can't figure out how to get off of them, right? And, 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 and it's rare um, that I really appreciate the outbound communication that I receive. And it's all too frequent um, that I miss great things because I never knew about them until a week after they happened and somebody said, oh, it was great, you should have been there, you should have brought your kids. And so, you know, that's what I mean when I say we just have so much immediate cleanup work to do. We just have so much work to do on the fundamentals. And yes, I and my co-founders have a vision for a lot of exciting things and mind-bending things and paradigm-shifting things that we would like to do. But first, we would like to just be less bad at what we get paid to do. You know? <laughs> I, I will underline that. The, uh, you and I were talking at lunch about the, um, the growth of online concerts. Um, either there have been some very significant large events 
that have been made available free for streaming that are sponsored. iHeartRadio has done them. Uh, um, Amex has done some very, very big ones um, that where they matched a, a, a large act with a, a, a well-known director to create a very special event. And, and you, have, you have a lot of these kind of growth here. And some people, and I'll put myself in that list, are, are happy to be able to watch that at home, especially now that you can throw it up on a big screen. Because we all know going to, the, going to a concert hall, you know, expensive tickets, parking, food, the hassle, the, you know, the guy that stands up the whole show in front of you can just really ruin your night. Do you see this as a real growth area? And there are, the, uh, there are companies like Stage It, as an example, where they're perf they are actually offering one-time events that are, that are paid, where there's actually a limited attendance, and they're more intimate, where the artist plays from their living room, or the artist plays from, the, from backstage, and the artist interacts with the audience while they're playing. They're, they're tweeting back and forth. What's your take on all I that? I mean, I'm really glad you mentioned Stage It uh, specifically, because uh, Evan, the founder, you know, is, is sort of a member of the same graduating class of entrepreneurs that I consider myself a part of. I've known him a long time, and, and I'm a huge fan of, of his as a, as a builder of these, uh, these small companies. And specifically, I think that's a great play, and I'll tell you why I like Stage It, and, and you'll know this true, to be true too, Brian. The, the economics are really tough. I mean, when you're in big and, and diversified businesses like ours, mm -hmm. you, you can make it work. But as a standalone play, the economics are tough for A-list artists uh, yeah. when it comes to virtual events or, or online events. Um, those artists are really expensive, and those shows are really expensive, and there's a lot of upfront money that's hard to recoup when you're just broadcasting uh, online. Um, you need a lot of help from your sponsors and your advertisers to make that model work. But what Stage It is doing is really focusing on developing artists whose, you know, who's uh, whose grasp exceeds his reach in the sense that there are people that are interested in that artist and would love to have access to performances by that artist um, outside of the geograph geographic area where that artist is, is capable of yeah, getting Yeah, that's the act, beauty right? of it. You can, you can uh, uh, people who have no access, to, have no opportunity to see a, an artist now can see an artist. And typically with, with uh, I know Evan has told me that you know, the, the ticket prices will be like five bucks or 10 bucks or something tip at the jar. most. They do tip jar. But the yeah. tip jar actually drives as much, if not more, revenue than the ticket prices because the fans appreciate the intimacy yes. and they, they're they so excited about having the ability to interact in real time while the performance is going on with the artist between songs. They'll like, they th throw money up or they buy merch. So that's an interesting. Uh, development that's just starting to come on. Listen, there's no question. I mean, my, my paycheck says Live Nation on it, but I still count myself among the rest of the world in, in that I prefer to give my money to an artist than right. to give my money to Live Nation, right? And so one of the opportunities that, that a platform like that provides is for fans to feel like they are They're directly it, right. patronizing the artist. You know, right. If you've ever walked by that that musician in the subway or on the right. street in New Orleans and you put that money in the hat, Right. You, know, you you feel like you are directly patronizing. Sure, and, and that's, that's what it powerful is. Powerful. It's, it's a it's a, a patronage model. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I want to come back to you. Um, we haven't really talked about apps um, and games. Um, what kind of growth are you seeing in terms of revenue from from those platforms? Well, I think you know there was a time, maybe it was three or four years ago, where you know every single artist had to have an application, and, and <laughs> all the labels were taking you know EPK footage and you know, backstage stuff and throwing it together and creating an application and trying to do that fan club model, which, you know, right. didn't really work. And then there are the companies like Song Pop and others that um, do music trivia, which I think are, are doing quite well. Um, I think there was uh, 300 million people using Song Pop at one point. Um, so, you I don't know, know I like the same songs kept coming up when I used it. Yeah, I got yeah, tired. Well, yeah. I got tired of it. So I think I think uh, the gamification of, of music is very interesting. Um, you know, we've we've been talking obviously to every social gaming company out there trying to trying to figure that out. But I, I'm not so sure that that is the outlet for um, for our music. You know, I think from and you know, Katarina will be talking about individual artists in the next panel. 
I think that's more of an artist focused mm -hmm. um, type of marketing play than than really than a monetization play for us. I th and I'm assuming you're referring primarily to to mobile apps, but you also th the opportunity to have a an artist showcase, particularly a new artist showcasing a console game. That's another whole ball game. That's huge. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I we continue to license our music into console games, and you'll see more and more of the console games and companies that own them putting out music services. And I think that's exciting for us. Xbox Music and um, Sony certainly has a has been in the in the, in the yeah. The, I mean, the competition to get into you know Madden, a Madden game or or any of those is is fierce, just as fierce as it is for national TV ad, if not right. more. Right. Um, uh, I see we're kind of bumping up against five. Uh, maybe we'll start taking some questions. If there's, uh, and if there aren't any, we'll just keep going. Questions, anyone? In the back? So, uh, interesting question. I, I don't know if you guys buy it or not, but I, I've heard a lot about you know, sort of the differences between, say, Gen X, Gen Y, their relationship to music, and the fact that Gen Y doesn't necessarily seem to have the same strong affinity. I know, Michael, you were talking about, you know, how, how much, you know, being the first to get an album and, you know, how that said something about you really meant something, and, and is that still true? And if, whether you buy it or don't, you know, do you think that, since we're talking about what's next, does, does digital have a place to sort of, you know, recreate that bond or, or you know, to, to make it more unique? To, to the next, you know, to the, say the Gen Y and the gen, generation after? You know, we, we put on um, a series of events every year in New York called Jingle Ball. Uh, Jingle Ball's at Madison Square Garden, and uh, it, uh, it's Z100's event. Z100 is one of our radio stations here in New York. Uh, and if you've ever been to a Jingle Ball <laughs> and you've ever watched somebody like One Direction come on stage and can hear the ear-piercing shrieks of 12-year-old to 18-year-old uh, girls, there's absolutely no uh, doubt in my mind that that same level of passion exists today as it did uh, 20 years ago. I'll, I'll second that. I'll, I'll point out that, you know, by the numbers, um, <laughs> which is where I always seem to find myself, you know, the, the, the consumption of popular music uh, today dwarfs what you and I were consuming it does. You know, 25, 30, yeah. 35 years ago. And so when, when you look at the shift, you're really talking about a format shift. And the, and the cheap analogy I always use is I think that albums, you know, in this case CDs, but, but also vinyl and other packages, are, are kind of like comic books in the sense that um, comic books and graphic novels are actually a really thriving niche business today. There are people who are fanatical about them. But in 1940 whatever, there were huge boxes of them underneath every teenager's bed, right? And you will never see that kind of product penetration for a comic book ever again. It was a constraint um, of the distribution format. And, and I think the same is true for that package. So it's not that people aren't as fanatical about One Direction as they right. were about right. NKOTB, but <laughs> the format has changed and the way that they express that has changed. Yeah, I want, I want to be really clear about this. Music is more popular today than it ever has been yeah. by a long shot. My kids, again, I go back to my kids, they listen to music all day long. They listen to music while they're watching TV. They listen to their music. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They, they listen to music. They listen to their music while I'm talking to them. They listen to their music. <laughs> they, that's, especially them. Especially them. That's all they do all day long. But every one of them, Every single one of his friend, my, my, my son's friends have a different soundtrack to their life. I had one. My friends, we all had one. We all remember when Synchronicity by the Police came out. We all remember it. We all remember the first Boston album. We all remember Pearl Jam. We all remember these bands. And now, and, and so the problem is, if I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I'm going to use music within my digital strategy, the model of tying to a single artist, Budweiser sponsored by, you're sponsoring Jay-Z, for example. I have to ask myself, is that enough? Now, what I need to do is I need to say, well, wait a minute. I have all these points of interaction. These bands have all these points of interaction. All the people here own these points of interaction. Stage It owns these points of interaction. And the really cool thing about it 
is that if you're a digital officer, if, you're, if you have a digital strategy, you're not just licensing the song anymore. You're not you know, signing a contract that says, make sure you wear my stuff. What you can do now is you can integrate what you do into each one of these touch points. And the really cool thing about it is you can enforce it. You can enforce what your message says. You can enforce how it's used. You can put gates in the way. You can do things like make sure they come to your store. That's the really cool thing about music, is that music represents a way to engage that doesn't exist anywhere else. And so I want to be, really, again, I want to be really clear. Lots of music just niched out into a million different places. So how do you harness that in some efficient way? Other questions? All right, so um, what new and emerging technology are you looking at that would be a game changer in shifting the way that you Can you monetize? speak up a little bit? Sorry. What, uh, what new and emerging technology are you looking at um, that would be a game changer in the way uh, that you shift the way that uh, you monetize music or the artist? I'll take a little stab at that. I mean, I think one of the things that we're looking at is data as a configuration. I mean, I mentioned all the different configurations before, right? You know, from way back when it was wax albums all the way to digital downloads. You know, data as a configuration means all the touch points that, that Michael was talking about. How are you collecting data on that individual artist? How are you monetizing that data? How are you actually doing more than just looking at a post-mortem and saying, okay, I've got the data, but what does it really mean? So we're working with a variety of different companies to understand when someone comes in and interacts with Rihanna's site or Lady Gaga's site, we've got a single federated login so that they then can log into every one of our universal sites. And so we're collecting data on that individual as they go through. And we're trying to create a pattern about those individuals, consumers, and do something with it. Um, that's going to be very interesting to advertisers in, in the future. How do you map in the demographics between those Fans that like Lady Gaga and the ones that like Taylor Swift and the ones that like Pringles. Um, and that's, I think, very interesting. Um, you know, and I think, Eric, you probably could speak even more intelligently than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would add to that. I, I, you know, not surprisingly, I, I think um, there are a lot of exciting applications uh, of new technologies that, that create and depend upon data that are going to prove to be real revenue drivers. The, the one that jumped into my head among 50 others I could mention when you ask the question, um, is geofencing. I really think mm -hmm. place and time context um, is today still uh, a, a nascent opportunity that is going to be realized over the next few months. Um, and I know we're going to do some really significant things around geofencing. I think, I think data, I, I mean, I think uh, the monetization of music is going to change drastically. And I know not people don't like, a lot of people who own rights to music will argue with me, but I think if you look at what's happening, you can see it. When you buy your phone, you, you have maps on it. And you don't pay for maps. And you have weather. And you have all of these things that you come to expect. And, but somebody's paying for that. Google's paying for that. Apple's paying for that. People are paying for that. And I think music is going to start to be served that way. You're already seeing it with streaming services. Pretty soon you're going to buy Amazon Prime, and you're going to have Amazon Prime, and it's going to come with music. And you're going to see music companies t taxing every single one of these touch points. So I think the way music gets monetized is going to change. But I think to, to the points that were made earlier, you're going to also see the product of music start to be more than just the song. It's going to start to be the data. It's going to start to be the access. And I think that if you own rights to music, or even if you don't own rights to music like us, we're very protective of that data because nobody else can do the things with data that we, that we can do because we, and the access that we can give to that demographic is very unique. And so I think you're going to start to see the product of music change. It's going to be much more pervasive and it's going to be much more complete. You know, you, you mentioned the, the bundling uh, of music, and we, di we didn't mention a very successful service that's out there today called Move, M-U-V-E, which was started uh, by Cricket Wireless, which you might not know about Cricket Wireless if you live here, but um, they're a, they, they operate in I don't know how many markets, uh, and they've, they actually bundle in an unlimited music service with 
their handsets and you pay one price, flat price, for voice, data, and music. And it's a huge hit. Yeah. It's a huge hit. It's like well, we're replicating that around the world. I mean, yeah. we have you know probably thirty of those type of deals in, mm -hmm. in, in territories around the world, and the idea is that you want to make it very frictionless for the individual consumer to have access to that music. So when you're buying a ter when you're buying a phone plan, a data plan, and it just comes with music, and it's a great music experience, and you can also, by the way, get ringtones as part of that. You don't have to buy them at two ninety nine. I didn't even know that. Um, it's it's a very very interesting way to consume music. And it makes it very easy. Yeah, the, the, the challenge for uh, content owners and service providers is to, is to make music available in a way that it seems free to the consumer. It is getting paid for, but it seems free. That's the, that's the, the big challenge. And Cricket's done a great job of that. How many more, how many more iPhones? How, how, if, you, if you knew that your, your phone or your car was going to come with every song ever I made. Mean, it, it was right there, and it was easy to use. Would you pay? Would you pay five hundred dollars more for that car? I would, if it was just seamless, and I never had to think about it again. And if you pay for five hundred dollars in your other car, I would. Oh, because, you mean at one time? Yeah, pay five hundred bucks. One time. Five hundred bucks. You know, your car is going to last four, you know four years or five years, or some of my neighbors like twenty years. But <laughs> they, 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 well, you can do any of the on-demand services for ten bucks a month, and that would give you fifty months. You know, the, the the thing is, like I I can I can stream music from my phone into my Bluetooth on my uh, on my car, and then I'm probably going to get in an accident because I'm sitting there trying to figure out what I want to play. Right. People will pay for convenience. People value music, but I think your your point, friction is a problem. And you know, our I think that the thing that's going to happen with music is you're going to start to see like these deals, like exactly like you're talking about. Because I would argue that people, it's funny the value, the, the cost of music is very low. I mean, if you think about how much you really spend on music for how much you spend on on a drink in New York, I mean, seriously, I, you go out drinking in New York. I mean, you know, it's like a hundred bucks, and you're not even drunk. You know? <laughs> So anyways, my point is that I think, you know, it, the problem with music is that we have an old broken system that we're fixing, but it takes a long time to fix. When it's fixed and it's easy to use, you know, people will pay for it. Other questions? Going once, going twice, sold. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>